Hello and welcome to Postcolonial Space. I am Masood Raja, and today I will continue my conversation with you about Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. We have so far covered up to the middle of page 54, and today my hope is to continue from page 54 and 55 on to probably page 56. So let me briefly give you what we have covered so far. Uh, so as we started this series of lectures, uh, we learned from the very first page how Freire imagines the world itself, right? And in which the natural tendency, according to him, of all human beings is to try to regain their full humanity, right? To aspire to regaining that. And what precludes them from doing that is an oppressive system which dehumanizes them, which gives us the binary structure of the oppressor and the oppressed, right? Now, the dehumanization system, according to Freire, is unnatural because it is imposed by the outside forces, whereas this desire to be fully human is vocational, it's deeply human. Now, the pedagogy of the oppressed then plays with these two competing forces, right? The oppressor and the oppressed. In the process of doing that, he also discusses at a certain point the nature of false generosity or false charity, which I've discussed, I think, in my second lecture. But what he means by that is that false generosity and false charity is the kind of charity and generosity practiced by the oppressors which throws, so to speak, crumbs to the people, to the oppressed, without changing the unjust situation or the unjust world in which we exist. And what we also learn in the process is that in an oppressive system, the biggest problem that the oppressed have is that that's the only reality that they know, which they have internalized. So the first project of education then is to, how do we make them realize that they need to think the world differently and in order to do that, they have to reconfigure the system that they have internalized. So these are some of the things that we have covered, right? And that takes us, which I already talked about, when Freire discussing what is the project of his book. And what he says is this book will present some aspects of what the writer has termed the pedagogy of the oppressed. We already talked about it, I think, in my second lecture. A pedagogy which must be forged with, not for the oppressed. And that is the crucial point. It has to be a kind of pedagogy that is forged in solidarity with the oppressed. And it actually must be led by the oppressed, their lived experiences, and then their way, view of um, reality itself. But that is the project of the book. What it is trying to teach us is how to develop a pedagogy of the oppressed with the oppressed, but not just a pedagogy aimed at liberating the oppressed, but also those who are the oppressors and hence equally dehumanized, right? Now, in my previous lecture, I had talked about how Freire uh, builds into his discussion uh, work of Lukács, right? Who was a Hungarian Marxist. And the reason he's using Lukács is because Lukács has this huge book called History and Class Consciousness, right? In which he attempts to answer the most important question in Marx, Marxist thought, and that is how do the workers become conscious of their own exploitation? How is that articulated? How to create alienated labor from alienated labor to disalienated labor. That is one of the most important books. And Freire is tweaking that, just as Lukács tries to explain how the workers come to consciousness of their own exploitation. And Lukács's approach is pedagogical, because what he's saying, 
is that the party, right, its organizational systems is the one that encourages the workers to talk about their exploitation, to actually verbalize it, talk about it, but there is an act of pedagogy involved there. And Freire is mobilizing the same educational project of Lukacs into the critical pedagogy, and that's why he is discussing it. Now, I have just put a quote, a brief quote on Lukacs from Wikipedia, but I highly recommend that you read his book, History and Class Consciousness, and I will post a link to description to the book. So uh, according to Wikipedia, and the reason I always use Wikipedia, some of my colleagues would probably um, you know, not find it proper. The reason I use it is because it's most easily accessible resource and you don't have to be part of a privileged university or library to access it, right? Lukacs also develops the Marxist theory of class consciousness, the distinction between the objective situation of a class and that class's subjective awareness of this situation. You see, you know, this is already figuring very prominently in Freire's discussion of objective and subjective approach to reality, right? We talked about it in the previous lecture. Lukacs proffers a view of class as an historical imputed subject. An empirically existing class can only successfully act when it becomes conscious of its historical situation. So that is the thing to remember, just as Lukács is saying, you don't just suddenly wake up one day and become aware of your class identity. It has to be a political act. Similarly, as Freire is arguing in this book is you don't historically, you don't wait for history to change things. No, history will always default, right? If we let it be, right? On the side of the oppressors. It's only when the oppressed themselves understand reality and then transform it is when history changes, right? There is no passive waiting. And that was the crucial point in Lukács, right? Coming to class consciousness was not necessarily a product of historical movement, right? To from past to the present. It had to be acted upon, right? The workers, the proletariat needed to become conscious of their own situation and then change it, right? So that's why he's going to Lukács. In the previous lecture, I had also talked about this particular quote by Lukács that he mobilizes, right? And, and I finally found a good translation of it. So I'm citing it here. And what he's citing here is crucial to his own development of critical pedagogy. He says, in the, and it's on page 52, and I read, we must to use Marx's words, explain to the masses their own actions, not only to ensure the continuity of the revolutionary experience of the proletariat, but also to consciously activate the further development of these experiences. And that's exactly what Freire is mobilizing, is that pedagogy of the oppressed, one purpose of it is to encourage the masses to talk about, to acknowledge the exploitative condition they, they are in, because that enhances not just the understanding of exploitation, but also verbalizing it, talking about it, discussing it, will then become a path to developing strategies to counter it. So this was some of the work that we have already done. I do strongly urge you to watch, uh, you know, uh, the other lectures, but. I will now move on to, as I have already been doing, reading parts of the text, and then as best as I can, uh, talking about them. As always, you are welcome to post any questions under this video, send them my way, and I'll try to answer them. Now, please uh, do keep in mind that I claim no expertise in these subjects, right? I just bring to you whatever little I know. Right, and the whole idea behind these videos is to share whatever I, I know freely. 
but also to become a part of a conversation. So the only way this can be an enriching experience for you as well as for me is if you become part of the conversation. And, you know, do subscribe so that we can stay in touch. All right, so I will move on uh, to today's text, right? And it's we are starting on page 54, okay? Uh, and I'll read first. The pedagogy of the oppressed, animated by authentic humanist, not humanitarian generosity, presents itself as a pedagogy of humankind. Okay, let's stop here. What is the distinction between humanist and humanitarian? It's pretty obvious if you look at it. Uh, authentic humanist project would be that takes into account within the logic of Freire's argument, the humanity of the people. Humanitarian, we already know the things that we call humanitarian aid, hu humanitarian support, which always presupposes that there is a recipient to whom those in a better economic or political situation must deliver certain goods, right? Without altering the situation that creates, you know, the figure of the recipient, right? Presents itself as a pedagogy of humankind. So pedagogy of the oppressed isn't just necessarily for the oppressed. It is the kind of pedagogy that can be transformative for the whole humankind. Pedagogy which begins with the egoistic interests of the oppressors and egoism cloaked in the false generosity of paternalism and makes of the oppressed the objects of its human, humanitarianism itself maintains and embodies oppression. So this is a critique of what? Of paternalism. What is paternalism when one part of a binary relationship assumes the role of a leader, of a father figure, right? And hence dispenses wisdom, materials, goods, charity to the lesser part, right? And that kind of pedagogy is self-centered. So the pedagogy developed by the oppressors is by its very nature paternalistic because it sees the other, it sees the ones to whom that pedagogy is being delivered as passive recipients, right? But also childlike. And, and it makes the oppressed the objects of its humanitarianism, right? Humanitarianism in a sense where you do not change the structures that create the dichotomous world. You just, you know, throw your scraps at the poor, at the workers, right? Without, and, and feel good about it maybe, without changing the basic structure of power in which you are in that dominant position and they are in that oppressed position. That is what he calls false generosity, right? Um, this is why, as we affirmed earlier, and I'm reading, the pedagogy of the oppressed cannot be developed or practiced by the oppressor, okay? By the oppressor means anyone in a dominant position from a detached perspective, you cannot develop a pedagogy that can be liberating for the oppressed. It would be a contradiction in terms if the oppressors not only defended, but actually implemented a liberating education. Because, I mean, their interest is to maintain the status quo, to maintain the system in which they exist. Most of the times they are not even critical of it because they have also naturalized their position in the hierarchy of existence, right? So, expect them to create the kind of um, pedagogy that would actually alter the world, undo their privilege, right? And center the oppressed. And that is what he's pointing out over here, right? So I go on, page 54. But if the implementation of a liberating education requires political power, 
right? Well, because that's the first question that emerges in one's mind, right? The moment you say, we are going to have a pedagogy of the oppressed, the oppressed must lead their own education and must also transform our, you know, the world of the oppressor. The first question that emerges is, how can they do that? Because we always assume that to effect positive change in the world, we must have power. I mean, how many of us have not felt like that? I, I have felt it all the time, you know, like when I have tried to do something in solidarity with others, in solidarity with my students and with my colleagues, I have realized that at a certain point, since we do not have the numbers, uh, you know, you feel helpless because you cannot change much. So we always think the change can only occur when we are in a position of power. How many of us have assumed that role? Uh, a lot of us liberals, right? We always think, okay, let me you know, keep working through the system until I reach a position of power and then I will change things, right? We internalize this logic that in order to effect change, you need to have power, right? Not realizing, and this is totally uh, on the side, that in the process of rising up within a given closed system, no matter how committed we are to eventually bringing about change, we are trading parts of ourselves in the process of that rise. And by the time we get to the top, not much of us will be left because we will be pretty much totally, if not totally, uh, you know, most of us will already have been incorporated by the system. Um, and so this, but if the implementation of a liberating education requires political power and the oppressed have none, how then is it possible to carry out the pedagogy of the oppressed prior to the revolution? That was a big question, right? How can we develop it unless we have power? So. What it presupposes is that we must first bring about the revolution and then institute the pedagogy of the oppressed. Now he's saying this is a question of the greatest importance. The reply to which is at least tentatively outlined in chapter four, which we will discuss. One aspect of the reply is to be found in the distinction between systematic education which can only be changed by political power and educational projects, which should be carried out with the oppressed in the process of organizing them. This is a really crucial distinction that when we are thinking of changing the education, we're thinking on systemic level and we realized we're thinking of the formal education, right? And that can only be changed when you have political power. And he's saying, I'll give a better or a fuller answer to this question in chapter four, but here, let's first distinguish between two modes of education, the formal systemic educational system, which we cannot change before the revolution, right? And the educational projects, which can be done without state power and which can incorporate pedagogy of the oppressed, because actually it is here in educational projects that the project of pedagogy of the oppressed, as we, we will learn, develops, right? So I'll read on. And this was on page 54. On the same page, then he goes on, the pedagogy of the oppressed as a humanist and liberation pedagogy has two distinct stages. What are those stages? In the first, the oppressed unveil the world of oppression and through the praxis commit themselves to its transformation. In the second stage, in which the reality of oppression has been transformed, this pedagogy ceases to belong to the oppressed and becomes a pedagogy of all people in the process of permanent liberation. In both stages, it is always through action in depth that the culture of domination is culturally confronted. Okay. 
So we already know that the pedagogy of the oppressed is a liberatory project. And now he's giving us two stages. He's already at length discussed the first stage, how do the oppressed come to the realization of reading the reality objectively and understanding their own oppression. But in the first oppressed, they unveil the word of oppression. That is a wonderful use of the epistemological model of ideology, that unveiling, that they must understand the nature of oppression itself. And then through praxis, right? And praxis, remember, is reflection and action, commit themselves to its transformation, to the transformation of the unjust order. And in the second stage, when the world around them has already been transformed, is when they will offer this pedagogy as pedagogy for all people. And remember, that will tie it into the two second most important project of claiming of humanity by the oppressed. First, claim humanity for themselves and liberate themselves. But in the process, do not to become oppressors themselves. They must also liberate their oppressors, help them find their humanity. And that's where the second stage comes in. Right, But it is always through action and praxis. So reflection, learning, thinking, but then praxis or practice to change things. These are the two stages that he lays down for us on page 54. Right? OK, then he goes on. Page 55, in the first stage, this confrontation occurs through the change in the way oppressed perceive the world of oppression. In the second stage, through the expulsion of the myths created and developed in old order, which like serpents haunt the new structure emerging from the revolutionary transformation. So we already understand that the first stage is pre-revolution. Right? This is when the oppressed are coming to realize the nature of their oppression. And they are developing a pedagogy to understand reality and developing actions to transform it. Right? And then after they have done that, is the second stage. Right? What is the second stage? If you look at any revolutionary movement, the biggest fear after the revolution was what? The counter-revolution, right? That the system that you have undone lives, right? And that it comes back to haunt the new established system. How? I mean, let's uh, take the example of the post-colonies. All the former colonies, right, become free and gain their independence, win their freedom. But as soon as they do that, right, since the larger structures of the world in which the colonies existed has not altered, they become then dependent now indirectly to the same powers. So a revolutionary breakaway would have been where you become free as nations and then become a part of, you know, an equal array of nations. That doesn't happen. So those dependencies then reappropriate all acts of freedom, you know, take them and make them part of the system. So you become a free, a free India, free Pakistan, free Zimbabwe, but are you really free? Because you still, your strings are still being pulled from elsewhere. Ngugi Chiango gives a great example of that. Um, you know, in his Devil on the Cross, you, you can watch my lecture on it, but also read the book. But so, so pedagogy of the oppressed then also must cater for that counter-revolutionary movement right, after the oppressed have changed the system and brought about change. Right? So in the first stage, this confrontation occurs through the change, right? The pedagogy of the first stage must deal with the problem of the oppressed consciousness and the oppressor consciousness. 
the problem of men and women who oppress and men and women who suffer oppression. It must take to account their behavior, their view of the world and their ethics. A particular, prob a particular problem is the duality of the oppressed. They are contradictory, dividing beings shaped by and existing in a connection, concrete situation of oppression and violence. Okay. So what we must keep in mind, right? In the first stage is to understand the nature of oppression itself. And how do we understand it through the pedagogy of the oppressed? And as we move further in the books, we will learn per practically steps to do that. But crucial in this process is that in the stage one, the oppressed must learn of the world in which they exist, how it works, how is their situation as the oppressed, but also the nature of the oppressor. You know, how do they work, right? Because we ought to liberate them as well, right? And then, and there, a particular problem is the duality of the oppressed. What, what is the duality? They are divided beings, right? Because they are shaped by the system in which they exist, right? And that system has been put in place through violence. Now, that was the biggest problem for Fanon, right? If you've read the beginning of The Wretched of the Earth, right, you know what I'm talking about. And that's why people who claim that Fanon is a prophet of violence don't really understand because they forget that he was a psychoanalyst. And when he's talking about the trauma of colonial violence, what he's trying to teach us is that you can't talk your way out of it. You have to literally destroy your oppressors, right? But the problem was the same, but his argument was that colonial system is a system of violences. It's put in place through violence, right? Here in the pedagogy of the oppressed, that is what the oppressed must confront in the first stage their own location in a violent system, where even their tools for thought and thinking are shaped by that very system. Now, how to escape the logic of that system as you transform it? That's the question. We are still at the first stage, remember, where the oppressed are coming to the realization of their own system. Freire goes on, and he's now describing the system of violence, right? Any situation in which A objectively exploits B or hinders his or her pursuit of self-affirmation as a responsible person is one of oppression. Okay. Such a situation in itself constitutes violence even when sweetened by false generosity, because it interferes with the individual's ontological and historical vocation to be more fully human. Let's stop there. Objectively exploits, right? What does that mean? That is part of a system in which without doing anything, I am exploiting someone else. Any system in which that is possible is a system of oppression. How? How can we talk about it? Think of the world around you, right? You and me and all, we can sit in our drawing rooms and talk about humanity and all, but are we objectively part of a system or supporting of, of a system that exploits us? Absolutely. You know, there are so many of my actions, things I buy, knowing that these are being made by people who are exploited, who do not have many rights, all of that is the system of exploitation, right? That's objective exploitation. And in any system in which one person can do that to another is a system of oppression. So the society, the world in which we exist is 
an oppressive word. It's a violent word because it interferes with the individual's ontological and history, because it interferes with that by keeping people fixed in place, making them work on slave wages. The system and me being a part of it is already creating conditions in which these people may not have the path to their full humanity, right? With the establishment of a relationship of oppression, Violence has already begun. You don't have to literally go and beat these people up. You, we live in a system which already is doing that to people, right? Never in history. So this is the thing. What he's trying to point out is that the system that claims to be generous and kind and shares uh, its resources it is, in effect, a system of violences. It's built in violence, right? Um, and then anytime something goes wrong, we are like oh, workers have destroyed this and peasants have burned their crops. The violence is always impugned, impugned on to the oppressed without realizing that the system in place is a system kept in place through epistemic and physical power and violence, right? And that's where he's questioning. Never in history has violence been initiated by the oppressed. Initiated, right? Not committed. Initiated. Why? Because they are always responding to a system of violence already in place, right? How could they be initiators, he says, if they themselves are the result of violence, right? If I am a silenced woman, right? If I am a gay person not fully having my rights, if I'm a peasant who doesn't own my own land, if I am a mig uh, migrant worker on a Texas farm not having access to clean water or even my basic rights. Am I creating that violence? No, I am recipient of the violence of the system. How can I be the perpetrator, right? How can I be illegal, right? When the system that's exploiting my labor itself is an illegal system of violence, that's what is. So how could they be initiators if they themselves are the result of violence? How could they be the sponsors of something whose objective inauguration called for their existence as oppressed? I mean, it's just like saying that if the slow slaves rose against their masters, calling them the beasts, right? Not realizing that it was the slave owners who had created a system in which human beings could be bought and sold as property could be dehumanized, right? Who were not human, the slave owners, right? There would be no oppressed had there been no prior situation of violence to establish their subjugation. I mean, where do the oppressed come from? It's not like you're born oppressed. You're born into an oppressive system, of course. So he's constantly now driving this thing home the question of false generosity, but a system in which oppression is created, but that system claims to be humane and claims to be civilized. And he goes on on page 55, violence is initiated by those who oppress, who exploit, who fail to recognize others as person, not by those who are oppressed, exploited and unrecognized. It is not the unloved, I, I love this sentence. It is not the unloved who initiate disaffection, but those who cannot love because they love only themselves, right? It's not the oppressed who unleash violences, who create hate. It's those who are centered on themselves and create a hateful system, right? Who commit violences. It is not the helpless subject to terror who initiate terror, but the violent who with their power create the concrete situation which begets the rejects of life, right? 
It is not the tyrannized who initiate despotism, but tyrants or tyrants. Right? It is not the despised who initiate hatred, but those who despise. It is not those whose humanity is denied them who negate humankind, but those who denied that humanity, thus negating their own as well. Force is used not by those who have become weak under the preponderance of the strong, by those, but by those who have emasculated them. These are like moving passages, right? Because he already is working with that binary structure of the oppressor and the oppressed. But also how the oppressors constantly argue and point to the oppressed as the problem. It's just like blaming the poor for their own poverty. They are lazy, they are violent, right? But what he's saying is that who has the power to create a system in which there can be a constituency, constituency called the poor and the oppressed, right? And if that system generates and creates this subjectivity, then whose fault is it? Where should we point our finger? At the oppressive system. And that is the first step in the pedagogy of the oppressed is, first of all, learning about the unjust system and then dislodging that system from your souls, but also to really saying, we are not the ones causing this problem. It's your system that's creating it. Let's change it. And in the process of doing so, let us save ourselves, but also you, the oppressor, right? And that is what he suggests is the project in the first phase of critical pedagogy. And I'm go now going to go to the last paragraph for today's discussion. In affirming Okay, so sorry, uh, uh, I'm going to skip this one because I was supposed to stop here. So this is the last paragraph that we just read, right? Um, so what have we learned then in today's conversation, right? We moved from he teaching us about the nature of pedagogy of the oppressed. And today then uh, giving us a few other things to think about. First of all, that there are two stages to development of critical pedagogy, right? And that to answer the question, how can we change the world and pedagogy if we do not have power, is to make the distinction between formal education and informal education. And that in the first stage, the oppressed will learn about their own oppression, right? And that can be done through educational projects. And after the revolutionary moment is when that pedagogy will also become liberating for the oppress, oppressors. And then towards the end of today's discussion, the passages I read, what he's trying to highlight is the dichotomous way in which violence is talked about and mostly impugned on to the oppressed. And what he's saying is, no, let's take it back to its source. If the humans are dehumanized within a given system of power, then those who have the power to do so maintain that power through violence. They are the ones who are creating and actually violently keeping a constituency, a group under their power, right? That is the violent system. But the promise of critical pedagogy is not to go and become oppressors, not to shape yourself in the image of the oppressor, but to create a new way of objective reality, way of being in which you liberate yourself as the oppressed but in the process, humanize your oppressors as well. So that is today's thoughts on the pedagogy of the oppressed. I will, of course, come back with the next installment. Uh, please do watch these lectures chronologically. I shouldn't even be calling these lectures. These are conversations. And as always, 
share your thoughts, your views on it, send me your comments, and let me know what you think about these. I hope these are useful to you. And with that, I will sign off today, and I will see you next time. Until then, stay safe, and peace and love.